first of all, allow me to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Stefan. I am an industrial designer, but I'm also many other things too. So uh, for the last eight years, I've been running my own design studio, which I have co-founded with a friend of mine, which is called Vosk Design Studio. And between the two of us and some of our employees, we've been doing some incredible design work, including some FPV drones, some educational equipment, but really the, you know, the, our bread and butter is like a thousand and one variation on this same blocky industrial bit of equipment, you know, that every industrial designer has seen thousands of variations of. So apart from that, um, I'm also a, a maker. So I like to create different things. I try to consider myself being a just really like hands-on kind of guy uh, in terms of the creative process. And I am also a design educator. I've been teaching industrial design uh, in the British Higher School of Art and Design for the last seven years. And uh, during that time, oh, by the way, the British Higher School of Art and Design, even though it's called British, it's actually located in Moscow, Russia. So that's where I'm from, uh, you know, licensing and stuff. So apart from that, I'm also moonlighting as like a game developer. I create uh, some fascinating VR experiences, hyper casual mobile games with like a side gig that I'm trying to do. Uh, but, you know, some of you might actually know me from uh, TikTok where I've made this video that somehow went viral uh, of me turning into a pink chair. So a lot of you, a lot of people have seen that. So uh, I'm hopefully giving you some context as to like what kind of a designer I am, like what's my background and what kind of stuff that I do. Uh, but really the most important thing to me personally is uh, the, you know, why I consider myself to be an authority on parametric design is if you Google parametric backpack, you actually got to get my backpack. How cool is that? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm joking, of course, it doesn't really give me any authority, but it's a fine little side note. So this is that backpack, but um, also, I need to explain to you why I'm actually doing this lecture over here. So, uh, as I said, I've been stationed in Russia for well, pretty much all my life. But recently, with all this developments going on in Ukraine, I have decided that I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I've decided to migrate. So now I am actually stationed in Tbilisi, Georgia. Georgia, as in the country, not the state. The sunny country of Georgia would, would, have, would have been sunny if it wasn't the middle of the night here where I am right now. So uh, the plan for today's meeting is going to be the following. First, I will give you a lecture on what parametric design is, you know, my interpretation. And uh, then we're going to have something of a discussion. Like I'm hoping that you will be asking some questions. If not, there will be also a survey form at the end of uh, this lecture that you can just fill in at your own spare time and then maybe ask some questions through that as well. And uh, lastly, I will share you all the files that I will be showing today. So you don't really need to, you know, take any specific like screenshots or, you know, make any uh, photos with your uh, phone. So, and hopefully we'll also share a recording of this lecture so that it is possible for all of you to re review this thing later on in your own spare time. So with that out of the way, Let's get into the parametric design. So parametric design. So what is it? So when we talk about parametric design, it's highly complex architecture, like some crazy thing. It doesn't really um, fit inside like an average human head. Uh, but what parametric design is, like the very simple explanation of it, which really doesn't give it justice, but it is what it is, is that parametric design is a method, like a methodology, where instead of shaping things directly, you use algorithms to create things for you. You as a designer, you don't create a chair, you create a little algorithm that will create you a chair. And now the most logical question at this point is why bother? Like if you can create something yourself, why should you go for this extra layer of abstraction? Why do you have to you know, create an algorithm that will do it for you? Uh, and the answer to this question will take the remainder of this lecture today, but uh, the, the, the key point that I'm trying to make throughout my lecture is that parametric design is the shortest way to bridge your design intent with your creative 
outcomes. So the term parametric, it actually originates in math. And when you try to apply it to design, it gets a little blurry. So let's the back end and let's, let's take it from Google and then abridge it a little bit. Is it parameter is a measurable factor that defines a system. So in case of design, a system is a design. So for example, a chair. And now parameters of that chair are going to be things like size, color, materials. So all of these you know, things, individual components, they come together to define what a future um, design might be, what a chair can even be. So even parameters like, I don't know, the distance between the workshop where the chair is going to be produced and the area where the material for the production is sourced, that distance is also some form of a parameter. And you know, if you take all of these parameters together, you get yourself a brief. So that is a pretty straightforward uh, you know, way of seeing things when you're dealing with the standard creative process, which I will carry on explaining. And then I will show how adding uh, parametric design principles kind of augments it a little bit. So we've got ourselves a brief, which has all of those parameters and all of the restrictions and all the requirements. And then we feed that to a designer in the standard creative process. And then designer takes that and with some creative liberties here and there, they produce a design. Now, the problem in the system arises as soon as the user come along, because the user needs to buy the chair. That's the ultimate goal of what we are trying to create, or at least needs to use it. And the user has a set of parameters of their own. We let just call them needs for the sake of this presentation. So user needs are things like comfort, price, longevity of design. And so uh, our user tries to match these needs against the qualities of the product that we are creating. So he's trying to take a look how comfortable this chair is, how pricey, how long lasting, how durable, things like that. So the logical thing for us to do would be to actually control the qualities of the final design. Like that's the whole idea of the entire game. But the problem here is if we don't really control the qualities of the product, like when you're creating something, the decisions that you're making, they're not directly related to the final qualities of the product. Like decisions that I'm talking about are like, for example, what type of plywood to choose, or like what thickness of material what kind of cloth to wrap your design in. So those are the things that you have to choose. These are the creative decisions that you're making. And then all they have some, you know, very vague uh, effect on the final qualities of the product. So in other words, there is this disconnect between the, the creative intent and the creative outcome. And then if, if you don't think that this is that big of a deal, consider answering either of these three questions. Like what is the most comfortable seat height for a chair? Or like what is the most cost efficient way of making a chair? Or what's the best color for a chair? Now, all of these questions might sound absurd because of how vague they are. We can't really define a like a, one universal most comfortable height for a chair because you know, uh, human beings come in different sizes and you know, some, some of us are kids, some of us are extremely tall. So, uh, it's, you know, picking an average height is not really an option. So the answer in really to all of these three questions in no particular order are there isn't, it depends, and I don't know, let's find out. But luckily, there is still a system in place to actually help us with dealing with, with these questions because ultimately we would like to know answers to them because, well, if you're creating something, it's not reasonable to ask yourself, what is the most beautiful color? But then it's quite reasonable for the user to expect your design to be beautiful. So when you're choosing a color, you'd like to choose the one that's most beautiful. I mean, subjectively speaking. So there is a system in place to help us deal with that in the standard creative process, which is called uh, feedback and iteration. Basically, the way it works is that you loop the entire design system and then you repeat it over and over again. So you create, you write a brief, you feed it to the designer, the designer produces the outcome, you take a look at the qualities of that outcome, then you make some measurements, evaluations, or you even show it to the user, then the user gives some feedback to us, and then we adjust the parameters of the initial brief, and we keep on doing that. 
you know, do that enough times, then either of the two things are going to happen. Either you're going to create finally an outcome that matches the exact needs of the user and you've got yourself an incredible design, or you're going to run out of the well, R&D budget or you know, R&D time allocations. So, you know, it's not really the most efficient system. It's still got flaws. So let's take a look at how we can augment this thing with the use of algorithms. And the first thing that we would like to do is to replace our designer over here in the middle with an algorithm. And like, make no mistake, there's still a designer involved in this process, but a designer now designs an algorithm. He is acting like an art director of sorts. So he is creating a system that will design a chair for him. And he will not be making creative decisions on his own, their own, yes. So uh, in that case, we can now see that the entire process has sped up quite a bit. So the parameters that we are sliding along basically in this visualization, they find their direct reflect reflection in the final design. So we adjust something, we see how it changes because computers are much faster at uh, creating designs than humans are. We still have to explain a computer how to do a design, create an algorithm, but you know, the iteration process, this going through these loops is much, much faster. Now, there is another cool thing that we can do with algorithms because algorithms, they can actually learn and they can actually deduce certain connections. And there is a thing called associations. And in terms of parametric design, associations are uh, the mental links that an algorithm makes between the qualities of the final product and the parameters. So our associations are going to be a replacement for the regular you know, form of feedback, basically. So for example, our algorithm by, if you let it running long enough, will start to associate uh, that some parameters like, I don't know, plywood thickness or the length of legs, for example, or like the material choice actually affect the stability of the final design. So once you've taught your algorithm how the chair is being made, then you can ask your chair, ask your algorithm to actually maximize for a particular parameter. You can tell it, okay, I don't care what plywood you're going to use. I don't care what thickness it's going to be. All I care for is that the final chair has to be strong. And now the algorithm will adjust everything on its own. So this is what I mean by bridging the gap between creative intent and creative outcome is that you're finally able to concentrate on things that are really matter. Because at the end of the day, nobody is, uh, you know, nobody mm, wishes to create a chair from a, I don't know, two inch plywood, for example. People want to make a beautiful chair, a comfortable chair. These are the goals. And, uh, you know, what we have to do is, you know, design chairs with specific parameters. and. What parametric design lets us do is make sure that those parameters align with the needs of the user. So the things that we are making creative decisions about are what is the right balance between comfort and style? Or like what is the right target audience for this chair? And then what does it mean for all us designers? Well, it means that we can do some cool things which are going to be shown in this video, uh, that uh, ultimately, like if we're expanding on this example of uh, the chair, we can create a system where our chair is no longer defined by you know, a single set of shapes. And we create this algorithm that determines what the chair has to be based on where it is located inside a flat, for example. So the user can come to us and tell us, hey, I need a chair that will be I know, seated right next to my fireplace, for example. And our algorithm would know that a thing that is located next to a fireplace probably has to be like closer to a lounge chair. It has to be lower, wider, and you know, it has to maximize for comfort. And then a different user comes along, which is like a toddler asking for a chair for them. And the algorithm can then adjust itself so that the chair is actually you know, smaller and you know, a little bit more cutesy looking. And then do this thing for all the purposes of the chair. You can have like a really true parametric model where a chair, if you place it next to a um, 
I don't know, a work desk is going to look all office looking and boring. And if you place it next to a bar stand, for example, then it's going to be like a taller thing with no backrest and like uh, really similar to a stool. And when I say place it next to you, I'm not saying that we're going to make this magical thing that transforms itself on its own. I'm talking about like virtual environments. So when uh, all that our user has to do is basically give us a point, okay, here's my flat, here's where I want the chair to be. And the algorithm, you know, a smart enough algorithm can actually deduce what the shape of this design has to be for that particular point or for that particular use case. Now, uh, doesn't click. Okay, here's a little side note, by the way. Uh, you might see uh, a lot of different terms when you try to Google for parametric design, terms like algorithmic, associative, computational, and even things like generative and procedural. And those are the things that basically design the same process, but with accents placed in different parts. So, you know, algorithm design concentrates more on algorithm. Associative design concentrates on that, you know, feedback and links between the different parameters or well, associations. Uh, parametric design is really the most um, commonly used term. It's a small, also uh, the least deep one because a lot of the things have parameters. So any design can be parametric. So, uh, I mean, obviously I chose it for the, uh, you know, for this presentation because it's catchy and because it associates with something. And if you put it, like if you type parametric design into Pinterest, for example, then you're going to be able to see much more images than you would get if you type in associative design. But if you talk with, you know, more highbrow designers or engineers, they're usually referring to what we call here parametric design as like computational design or associative design. And people from like uh, movie making and video uh, game industry, they're usually referring to uh, parametric design principles as generative design or procedural design, because on their end, it requires a lot more um, creativity. Like the actual algorithm has to make create choices instead of waiting for you to give them some input. Because you know, sometimes they don't care about the decisions that are being made. All they care for is that there is a forest ahead of our player, for example, or there, is, there are mountains at the back of uh, a movie set. So they just ask the computer, generate some mountains. We don't care which ones. So hence the generative design term. So what is an algorithm? Well, uh, does it have anything to do with computers? Well, an algorithm can be many things. And as a, once again, very brief description, an algorithm is a set of rules followed in a problem solving operation. You see, it doesn't really have to do anything with computers. I mean, it helps, but it doesn't have to. So an algorithm by this definition is a thing like this, like an IKEA manual, for example. This is an algorithm. We have some individual parameters at the beginning of the process, maybe like the screws and knobs that we have and all the pieces of wood. And then we can turn that into a final design by for following an algorithm. So in this case, an algorithm is completely analog. Not, there is nothing digital about it. But there are many other algorithms. And when we talk about parametric design, we envision things like this, things that seem to have no logic or to be too complex to even grasp. But you know, the underlying logic behind them doesn't really have to be that, you know, that complex because parametric design, ultimately, it's not about making things complex. It's about simplifying everything using complex tools. So the underlying logic under this chair, for example, is a Voronoi diagram. Like I assume a lot of you have seen it or even know what it is, but basically a Voronoi diagram is present like all over design, like architects love it, especially like guys who do parametric design and it's all over product and industrial design, maybe like graphic design examples. So uh, the, the thing is like, it looks complex, but you know, creating it is actually really simple. The underlying logic underneath the Voronoi diagram uh, which could be found, by the way, all over nature. So like cracked ground or like this undersize of mushrooms and the skin of, of a giraffe, I guess. So all those things, they have the same structure and they look really complex. But the logic by which this algorithm uh, is creating this shape is really simple. Uh, like 
Simply put, if you take a 2D plane and you put a few bacteria or like a few cells and you let them grow in perfect circles, as soon as they start pushing against each other, they're going to form these flat lines. And so you, what you're going to get is this like shape consisting of multiple polygons. So this is like a really, really simple explanation of what Voronoi diagram is and how it is created. But once you understand that, suddenly shapes that are much more complex and like three-dimensional, like, I don't know, foam, for example, so bubbles, they become a lot more comprehensible. So and even like architecture that you know can use for annoy just by the look of it, suddenly becomes more logical when you start understanding what's like the underlying principle underneath it all. So uh, Voronoi, like the idea of using Voronoi is really, really old. So this is the first record of a Voronoi diagram. It was created in uh, 1644. It's actually a drawing of a solar system, like a representation created during that time. And uh, if you might, you, you might think that the guy who created it, you know, had a Voronoi in his name, but actually no, it was Rene Descartes who was responsible for creating uh, this particular drawing. And it was actually, I think it was like over two centuries before Gregory Voronoi actually invented the algorithm for Voronoi. So you don't have to invent an algorithm to make good use of it, is what I'm trying to say here. Uh, the first parametric model ever created is not depicted in this image, but it looks something similar. So uh, Antonio Gaudi is actually credited as one of the pioneers of the parametric design methodology. But obviously, he never used any computers for creating his designs too early for his time in physics, of all things. So during his time, it was um, widely understood that there is such a thing as catenary. Now, the beautiful thing about the catenary is that it's a shape of a perfect arc that you know uh, is the, the strongest arc of them all. If you create it in the shape of a catenary, basically get the strongest one. Uh, and the other beautiful thing about catenaries is that they are really easy to create. Basically, if you take a piece of rope and then you hang it from two poles, the line that this rope is going to assume is a catenary. So it's really easy to model that. You just take a chain or a piece of rope, then you trace the line that is being produced, then you flip it upside down, and then you make sure that you put your bricks and stones in the right shape. And then you get yourself a mathematically the most stable kind of arc possible. Now, Gaudi was a smart guy. So he realized that you don't have to do it in two dimensions. What you can do is you can create actual models, like a full scale cathedrals using this principle. So what he would do, he would draft a layout, like a two dimensional layout of the cathedral. He would then identify which areas would need to be, you know, most important, like this like center stage within the church, things like that. And then he would hang some pieces of rope, tie them together and a few sandbags here and there. And doing that, he would actually see a design emerging from it. So he was trying to really simplify this, uh, this map. And then he would just measure all the dimensions uh, and he'll put it on paper. Or even he would hang this thing in the ceiling of his workshop and then he would have a giant mirror to look at this thing to a reflection of this thing. And he actually visualize how the design might look. So the underlying logic here is that he was trying to simplify things for himself, even though the final design looked like super uh, tricky. I have a message that my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me? Can there you, you go. hear there me you now? Go. Oh, yes. now I'm back. Yep. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You were saying how it turned out to be a little bit more complex. It was towards the end of uh, the slide. So. Okay, I got it. So basically, yeah, the, the structures, even though they look seem extremely complex, the underlying logic is quite simple. And he was not creating this complex models to make things harder for himself to make this, you know, visualizations that nobody can comprehend. He was actually trying to simplify himself because that's the ultimate goal of any design process. Uh, and that was the reason he was able to produce things like this before any of the CAD software 
you know, which is even you know, crazy, even by today's standards, it's on the, the amount of detail there. But then once you understand the logic, it's way easier to understand this thing. So my point is that parametric is complex, but it serves to simplify things. Um, I actually like not to compare myself to Gaudi or anything, but I applied a similar logic when I was designing the backpack that I have featured previously. So this is called 4 pack. And the idea for me was that I wanted to create a backpack that would be able to adjust its shape and size based on the wearer's uh, shape of the body and also based on the content uh, of your backpack that you'd like to you know, daily drive. And uh, I tried looking around for different algorithms that people have invented. And I found an algorithm created by Ron Rack that uh, designed uh, this really complicated pattern of origami tessellation. So it's tessellation is like subdivision of the surface that he was envisioning uh, of using in architectural models because the idea was that terrain on top of which you might want to build a house might be really complex. And then the, an adaptive structure which looks something similar to this, would be really good at adjusting its shape to the terrain. And then you can put it on the ground, adjust it a little bit, and then fix it in place and have your design. Uh, I figured that, hey, you know, body is quite a complex terrain, so why not apply that to creating a backpack? And, you know, that's what I did. And for the longest part, uh, I mean, I was still during my educational process. I didn't know all of the possible tools uh, for use in parametric design or much like any of them. So I used a lot of paper models. So I just did a lot of gluing and you know cutting things out of paper to full structures like this. And then I tested them over and over again. And while doing that, I started researching what if there are other ways to simulate physics of a folding piece of paper. And I realized that there are there are actually like pre-made algorithms that people have created. I've used one, an algorithm created for uh, Grasshopper, which is a plugin for Rhino 3D as a software. So I used that to actually simulate origami. And that let me run my computer overnight and let it produce a bunch of really weird shapes so I can test how adaptive my design really is. So I'm going to show you the video. The featured in the final presentation. So uh, this is obviously like a student project. There is no like way around it, but you know it shows the creative process that you know might take form within the parametric design discipline. So uh, another example of an algorithm 
that I'd like to share with you, which is which has nothing to do with math or like with complex calculations, because that is usually the main deterrent. You know, that the, the stuff that people don't really like about parametric design, that has to do with the right kind of like mindset of like measuring things and trying to match things together. So luckily there are things that can allow you to do that without actually using a math. And that has nothing to do with computers, by the way. It has to do with mold, slime mold, by the way. So this is like this weird organism, organism thing that looks like, well, it looks like some kind of mold, but it's like a lot soft and squishy and it can actually travel long distances on its own. So, I mean, gradually it doesn't really, it's not a venom kind of structure, uh, but slime mold is really good at navigating mazes. So what it does is that if you put it at the beginning of the maze and then you put a little bit of oats on the other end, and then you let this slime mold grow, eventually it will figure out where there is no food and retract back and then travel to the areas where there is more food. And that is like kind of a, a really cool property. So the researchers that found out about it, they decided, well, they made the next most logical thing, which is they took the map of Tokyo and they mapped all of the locations of the train stations uh, in the Tokyo suburbs with oats. So nutrition sources, the stuff that the slime mold really likes, and then they put this bit of slime mold in the middle where the center of Tokyo would be, and it would let it grow for the next 26 hours to find all of those oats and then create the most uh, optimal route of transmitting nutrition along its body. Now, just to be sure, that is not the way how the Tokyo uh, railroad system was designed. So it took actually like hundreds of years and a lot of like engineers, a lot of government officials and like communities working together to create that thing. But what I'm trying to show here is that an algorithm that is applied in the right area could actually create a structure as efficient as the result of labor of like hundreds of people working on it over hundreds of years. So uh, as I said, my point is not all algorithms are digital, but computers can replicate them much faster. So you don't have to use a computer, but it helps. So the next point in this presentation is how? How do I start doing parametric design? And this is a bit of a trick question because parametric design, like there are so many things parametric these days. So the short answer is you're probably already doing it. So if you're using any kind of software, uh, you know, from this list, any kind of software that lets you create, for example, a cube, not by creating eight individual points in space, not by stitching together like six surfaces, but by using a tool used called cube, this is a parametric software. Uh, it allows you to do something which is called parametric modeling, which is basically creating models with a parametric design method. Uh, so it's not that deep as this, you know, the system that I was showing to you before. It can't really, you know, deduce the logic of how the chair is going to be used and adjust its shape based on that. But it allows you to simplify your design process to a bunch of parameters that you can tweak afterwards. Like, I guess, Everyone has used SolidWorks and you know that you can make a design and then you can go back and change some parameters like the width or the thickness of the structure. And then that would reflect the, you know, that would find a reflection in the final shape of the object. Now, a parametric design tool as opposed to a parametric modeling tool is a little bit more complex. Usually, uh, there, basically there are free available softwares at the moment that can do that in you know, like a very, um, easy way. So these are Rhino Grasshopper. So Grasshopper is a plugin for Rhino. So I don't really have to say Rhino, but you know, Grasshopper 3D is the software, the one that I'm using. Then Generative Components and Dynamo. They're all something which is called uh, scriptable interfaces. So think about this way. So when you're making any model, uh, you're creating it using a bunch of different tools. Those tools are located somewhere like at the side panel that you just click, create a cube click, create a line, click, extrude that line into a surface. Then with a few more clicks, you create a thickness to it. Now a uh, scriptal interface for modeling software is basically a thing that lets you abstract all that 
into a map. So those nodes to the right of the screen, those are individual commands. So those are things like connect two points with a line or extrude that line into a surface or add thickness to that surface or cut that surface. And then you connect them, these nodes with lines with like wires and you see your design flowing from left where there is not, no geometry to right where all of the geometry has been created. Uh, it gets complex, and I'm not going to be that guy from Matrix who looks at the code and says that he doesn't really see any like numbers. All he sees is like the, the, the actual stuff that the code is meant to represent. Like I'm not going to be one of those guys. So this is the algorithm for the chair that was featured in this today's presentation. It looks complex. It's not that complex once you start digging into it. Uh, and the good thing is that you don't have to understand it in order to make use of it. So you can compact all of that into a single node, a single tool that says design me a chair. And then I can pack that or I can give it to you and then you can use it in your own design work. And this is the beauty of the parametric industry is that people are creating tools that are then shared between the different uh, industrial design practitioners. Um, a thing like my way of sharing this thing with you today would be for the use of a platform called Shape Diver. I don't know, you might have heard about it, but this is uh, an online interface that allows you to upload your Grasshopper interfaces or Grasshopper algorithms and allows the user to play around with them directly. If you follow this link later, you might take a look at this demonstration. So it's basically an online interface. It will allow you to tweak a few times, and then you can use even use the AR uh, to actually place this thing within your house. So you can go there, and you can actually see like the, the beauty of this parametric model, like working in real uh, real time. And if you go through that interface, you might find some really unusual examples of like different chairs that you can create. So I have basically abstracted this design to three different sliders, how much of a bar stool this chair is, how much of a lounge chair this is, and how much of a toddler chair. So by tweaking these parameters, you can, for example, find a perfect mix between a bar stool and a toddler chair. So a toddler chair designed for a bar environment. And you know, a design doesn't really, you know, the algorithm doesn't really see a problem with that. It's just gonna give you a fun little result out of it, like a tall toddler chair. So that's really the beauty of the algorithm is it really allows you to uh, create some new ideas that you didn't even plan for ahead of time. So there are of course more complicated ways of getting into uh, parametric design, or I guess the, the areas of parametric design which you can advance into later on, those require coding. So uh, all of these three pieces of software like Grasshopper, Generative Components, Dynamo, they are all, um, they all have functionality for you to actually script new tools. So if there isn't a tool for creating, I don't know, a cylinder, for example, for whatever reason, you can just you know, apply your coding skills to create one, to share it with people. And then, well, the sky's the limit. Uh, obviously that's not an area where, like that's not the thing that I would encourage you to begin with, but uh, my creative process went something like this. I learned Rhino as a modeling tool, uh, no parametrics there, just, you know, modeling things out, then I wanted to, for the purposes of making the backpack that I created, I wanted to create a uh, well simulation of uh, foldable paper or like leather in my case. And so what I ended up doing is I found out that there is such a thing as Grasshopper. And I found out that in Grasshopper, you can do just that. And I downloaded someone else's algorithm for simulating physics. And that's what I you know, used for. So that project that you saw, the backpack, that was actually the very first project that I used Grasshopper on. It took me about like four months to create this thing. And it was a nightmare, but you know, it kind of shows the, the beauty of the software that, you know, a first time user can actually make something, uh, which is arguably one of my most famous works that I have ever done after that pink chair guy thing. So uh, after that, I realized that if I learn C sharp, like this, the coding language, I can actually expand on my knowledge of Grasshopper because I can create my own algorithms. So that is what I ended up doing. And then through that, I realized that there are some other places when I can apply 
this scripting language. And in my particular case, it was Unity because I was really fascinated by the rendering capabilities and the capabilities of simulating physics. So uh, I realized that, okay, I know how to create shapes using code. What if I apply that into an environment where the image, the resulting image is going to look really nice and the physics is going to be really cool? Because, you know, much as I like Grasshopper and Rhino, even though all of the animations that I've shown to you previously were done there, the rendering is not exactly realistic. Like it's fine, but it's like heavily stylized and it's not nearly as fast as the stuff that you can create in Unity. Uh, for some reason, okay. So this is you know, true shade a hatch flow thing that Kohar mentioned before. So this is the kind of stuff that I am creating in Grasshopper and I'm just sharing it on Reddit for other people to use. So um, the, the story behind this particular pattern is like very long, but the idea was that we once had a client who eventually disappeared and they wanted us to create a really efficient way of 3D printing chair. Um, so I spent some time uh, devising this thing and then the client kind of like, I mean, it happens with creative project, the client disappeared. So the project kind of went down under. And then I think five years later, I was invited to a TV show and I was supposed to print a, a ring there. And I realized, okay, I need to print a ring while I will be on stage talking about the ring. So it has to print really, really fast. And I realized, hey, I actually have that algorithm. So in a couple of nights, I actually tuned it up and created that algorithm. The show that I was supposed to feature on got canceled. So I never actually got my TV moment, but uh, I got a really cool ring out of it. And I figured, hey, well, I already have this algorithm. Why don't I just explain how it works and share it online? And it is one of my explanations that Kohar was uh, well stumbled upon. And well, now I'm here. So uh, let me show you the video. You know Truchet tiles? This geometry you put in a grid and then twist a few times to get some really complex mazes. Turns out, if you redesign Truchet tile in three dimensions, copy, then stack, then twist, you get a structure with some really cool properties. Let me show you. Let's make it longer, wrap it in a loop, fill the space in the middle, and get rid of the top and bottom planes. Now pay attention to the model cross-section as we scan through it vertically. Watch how every layer is a single loop that stays unbroken no matter how complex it gets. Such single-shell structures are really efficient for 3D printing, and the added complexity makes for some very strong walls. I'm actually so impressed with this pattern, I even gave it a name, Hatch Flow. I'm making this video so you can model this thing for yourself. Maybe you'd like to collaborate too. Or you can just download the model down below. I'd like to see it printed out in different scales. Sadly, I'm still on lockdown, so I cannot do it myself. Wanna help? Maybe you can stress test it too. Either way, Stjopa, out. Well, then it's, I'm talking about the stuff which is not really related. So I was at a lockdown at that moment, and I just figured, hey, people can actually print it. And they did, and I got some stress tests out of it. You know, the power of the internet and designed by community. Uh, you know, this was the stuff that I create in Grasshopper. Like create a few blocks, twist them around, wrap them in a loop, and then create a complex baz out of it. Uh, things that I create in Unity are a little bit more complex and creative, and uh, it's closer to generative design because like I said before, it is when um, generative design is when your algorithm is actually making creative decisions and is creating some random stuff. So this project was called Pro Product of Random. These are a bunch of uh, random products. So I wrote an algorithm for Unity or like a software that I created in Unity to just create random ideas of products and like create simple GIFs out of it. So this required a lot of scripting and like making sure that the surfaces stay intact and you know all the rendering and i eventually wanted to add physics to it and maybe even turn it into a vr game where you're given random tools and you grab them and you try to solve some really simple tasks with the use of this really complicated uh set of uh, equipment but i never got around to it but this is like hopefully shows the level of complexity that you can achieve uh, with like actual like scripting.
we can create all sorts of shape, all sorts of ideas and stuff that looks way better than uh, the stuff that you create in Grasshopper. So here are my conclusions. So parametric design uh, is a design methodology of making things indirectly through the use of algorithms. Simple as that. Parametric design is a way to bridge your design intent with your design outcomes and in an as efficient way as possible because you can't let you concentrate on the right things. So like I said, parametric design allows you to act as some sort of an art director. So you're only concentrated on things that define the visual language of your chair. You're not talking, you're not thinking about individual lines, you're not thinking about individual surfaces. You're trying to explain what your design is with you know, as little words as possible. So think about it this way. If like a designer is trying to create a, uh, a chair, they're trying to match several surfaces together. If uh, like an art director, from the perspective of an art director, a uh, creative process behind a chair is not limited to just you know matching surfaces together. It is about brand DNA. It's about like what our design communicates to people. It's about the ideas that we're trying to portray with the design that we are creating. So you know it's like a, keeping a bit of a, a bigger picture in mind. So parametric design is catchy both visually and thematically. Like this is by far one of the most catchy things. Like whenever I post something about parametric design. People like it. Like I can make a simple mobile game. It won't nearly get as much attention as parametric design for some reason. So I guess the reason that you're here is because you've heard this terminology and you've seen some complicated models and you'd like to know how it's done. And I guess it's in human nature to try to understand the shapes that are so mesmerizing in their complexity, but actually have this one elegant way of uh, explaining them. And uh, well, even though parametric design is very visual and very catchy, it doesn't really have to be. So, you know, you can use it for simple things too. And also uh, parametric design has many names, which might be a little bit confusing, but it is what it is. You know, the same process can be described as generative procedural parametric algorithmic uh, or computational or parametric. So it's all basically one of the same thing with accent placed in different areas. So my, some people might argue otherwise, I guess the truth is somewhere in the middle. And this will be the final slide of the presentation that features all of the important links. So, and my face, hey, would you look at that? So uh, it has the link to the slides. So if you scan that using the QR code, you're gonna get to this slide where you can get all the other links. So you can get to the survey, to the chair, hell, to my to my Reddit or YouTube. I don't know. You can even drop me a line in the email. So um, now we're closing in on the part where I ask you if you have any questions, which I would be happy to answer. So do you? I do have a question. Great. Um... So thank you, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I'm in interior design, I'm a senior right now, and we've actually delved into Grasshopper a little bit in the past. Um, we've done a lot of our modeling in Rhino, and that's probably what I'm most comfortable with. Um, starting this semester, I'm actually doing a furniture design class where our teachers are well-versed in Grasshopper and expect us to kind of like, um, look through different geometries, pick a different geometry to kind of solve issues and create furniture out of it. So my question is, because I'm very, um, I'm really not good at Grasshopper, um, what was your step to really like research and learn? I go to YouTube, I try to find forums and articles on how to utilize it, but it's still a very complicated software. Um, how was your approach to research and delve really into it? Yeah, that, that's a great question, because I actually had kind of a weird way to learning it. So what I started with is basically what everyone starts with is I basically went into online resources. I looked into a website called Parametric House, and they have a bunch of different short videos that explain to you how to make a particular like structure. Like they show you a Voronoi diagram wrapped around a circular vase, for example, and they tell you how it's done. And then I've been going through those. But then I realized that I'm not really learning much because once I try to um, 
conceptualize something of my own. I realize that I don't know the tools well enough. Like I'm going through the motions that they're showing in the video, but I'm just blindly copying that uh, as opposed to actually learning. So I decided to start super simple. And so I was trying to create uh, use cases for Grasshopper in the projects that I were making. Yeah, like a, a, I guess I can show it to you. Uh, Oh yes, I, I saw this on your website. Oh yeah, so that yeah. was the thing that yeah, yeah. Uh, that I've designed just before, just prior to this backpack. And so what I took, I took that design and was like, okay, well, my backpack would require me to understand the underlying logic between like folding different uh, like planes in like a massive scale. But the simplest version of it would be creating really like two sets of hinges that would loop into this like cone looking polygon thing so that was like one of the first models that I actually created and just by i said okay i i, I can figure it out on my own like i don't need a youtube tutorial telling me how to do it i created and like a decimal algorithm that barely worked but then i was like okay huh that works so then try to look at the project that i already have and try to implement that. So I then tried to turn that into like a foldable chair thing. So it's like, okay, the logic is the same. It's basically about rotating different parts. What if I make that into a foldable chair? And then like going through different projects, I mean, basically backtracking, like these were already completed projects by that point. I was like trying to see, okay, now I, that I know that Grasshopper exists. If I knew about it before, was there any chance of me like using Grasshopper to simplify anything? So I guess that is uh, my creative process. So I tried doing like some YouTube tutorials and I, I assume they you know, gave me some basis, some understanding as to like, what are those nodes? What are those lines? What are those things that connect and form geometry? But then after that, I realized that I went to this pitfall of just repeating things without really understanding them. So I decided to start super simple and then expand on it. And the other great thing, by the way, yeah, I should definitely mention this is Grasshopper Forum. So I think if you go there, you might find some of my older posts of me just asking for things. Like I would draw a, uh, a diagram, like a nicely illustrated one in Grasshopper, like, hey, I'd like to make this, but I only have like this. How do I turn one thing into the other? How do I like bend this shape? How I distribute the points around it? And it really, you know, the community is there is totally amazing. So I guess that would be my way of learning it. I don't know if it applies to everyone. After all, we all have different ways of learning. Some people are like hands-on, like I said in my you know, beginning of this presentation. Uh, some people like it in a more structural way, but you know, take a look at the Parametric House uh, website. It's you know, kind of Thank fun. You. It shows the different use cases. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's kind of how I was learning. I was watching videos and then just trying to copy it. But then when I wanted to apply it to my own design, to the space, that's when things got really tricky and things were not working. And that's why I was like, oh gosh, it's, it's frustrating. But it is a step where you can kind of like watch these videos, learn a little bit and then try to apply it. But um, I'll really try to keep it quite simple. So thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, you don't really notice how complex things get when you're repeating it after someone. But then at some point, this, this algorithm just, you know, becomes totally out of your control. There is no way for you to conceptualize how uh, to change something and, you know, keep it working. That's that's like the tricky bit. So keep things simple. And hey, you, you've got my email. So if you have a question, you know, just write to me. The worst case scenario, I'm just going to ignore you, which hopefully I won't. Thing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, so uh, the idea, uh, okay, how long did it took for me to build an algorithm off this chair that I've shown you? Well, the funny thing about it is that this was one of the early things that I tried to create when I was like only learning Grasshopper and then I just dropped it and abandoned this thing completely. And then I returned to it uh, with this like past knowledge that I accumulated over the years uh, for this particular presentation. So I believe like, before I went from a completely unfunctional, like a mess of different lines to this particular algorithm that I've shown you in like, I think like two days. 
but um, I don't know how representative it is because the underlying logic was like described before. So it was like a very, really big blueprint was created when I was just learning the software. Uh, so the, the, the way I usually do things with Grasshopper is I create so different blocks and areas which I think should do certain thing. Like, like, okay, I need a chair. So I'll start with a point, but then I need to create legs. I'll just draw an area and say, I will be creating legs here. Then I will draw another area, which will be saying, okay, I'll be creating a seat over here. And then I will be joining them together in the next little box. And then I, I draft it like so. And then after that, I start filling in, okay, this little part has to create legs. How can I make them? So I had that plan. I had this, this map that I've created previously, and I've only like went back to fix all of the individual components. So uh, because the process was split into two things, it's hard for me to say it exactly. So it could be anywhere from like a week to, you know, two to three days. So I guess it's not that big of a, of a gap though. Well, there you have it. So I guess a week is too much for an algorithm like this. Um, but, you know, I think it's like a thing that you can do in two days with my knowledge. Well, hey, you can hit me up with some, some, some assignment for me to check my skills. Maybe if your use cases are quite interesting, I might as well just, you know, poke around with them. It's really fascinating what you can do with this software. Uh, yeah, so basically a blocking, but I mean, this is the underlying logic behind parametric design process is that you're trying to create this, we call them black boxes sometimes. So this is like an area that has things coming in and things coming out. Like you don't know how it works, but you know that it has to do that particular thing. Sometimes you can go online and find an algorithm that will fit that, you know, black box definition and do the thing that you need. Sometimes you would just, Take that, take a screenshot of that, send it to a forum, and then let people help you create the thing that you're trying to create. But either way, it's really important to actually like make sure that you, you block things out and then you create the final thing. Don't try to create the entire process in one go. That's you know, start by observing the structure at the like bird's eye view and then zone in closer and closer. I think what's super frustrating is sometimes one little component or input can screw up the whole thing and then you don't know why and then you have to go back into those those sections yeah. and kind of like go back and figure out mess with numbers and yeah it can be kind of drive you crazy a little bit yeah the, 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 basically, I'd say, yeah, the most complicated part is the, the logic by which the computer is passing things mm -hmm. from one to the other, like a, a thing that might not look like a problem in the middle of the process mm -hmm. could turn out as a disaster towards the end. So yeah. it might be that even though your algorithm looks fine 75% of the way, your mistake is not at 75%. Your mistake was made at 25%. You just yeah. didn't notice it up until that, that area. So yeah, well, I guess the answer is uh, to just start simple and to you know share things with other people. Like, you know, there isn't that much to it to sharing your, your algorithm because the good thing about it is even if you share it, not that many people are actually going to be able to steal it and use it. So uh, unless they're actually going to ask you to explain, okay, what the hell is going on? And uh, the, 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 and yeah, sure, you might try to always optimize things so that anybody could use it. But in, in reality, like I got this comment on Reddit uh, actually yesterday when I posted one of the videos that I showed in the presentation and the guy said, hey, can you give me the, the algorithm? And I was like, sure, I'll give it to you tomorrow. I just need to clean up a few things. And he's like, yeah, but usually cleaning up is not really happening. <laughs> it's like as soon as you got your design, you're happy with it and you're like, okay, it looks ugly, but it works. So I'm going to be the only person on this planet who knows how to use it, even though it's public now. All right. All right, so I'll leave you to it. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. Well, I just wanted to wrap up and we'll, we'll follow up um, shortly, but um, thank you so much for presenting and um, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch. All right.
Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs>